Uh, brilliant. So my name is Matthew Baird. Um, I've been involved in social housing recruitment now for 10 and a half years. Um, I set up on my own beginning of 2021. Um, and I run, run weekly social housing roundtables as a part of doing that. Um, and they're, they're brilliant because there's such an excellent networking uh, opportunity and everything else that comes with it. I think we just lost someone there, but they'll be back. Um, but Halima, you and I met at the, was it the Centre of Excellence for the West Midlands event. I can't, was that what it's called? Yeah, yeah, it was the Centre for New Midlands. Um, it was the, in May, I think, we, we had a guest lecture with Eddie Hughes. Um, and then we, uh, we met there for the first time and started chatting about kind of respective work. Um, yeah, I think, I think it was Dominic, wasn't it, from um, Spring who introduced us. And then, um, you know, it, it just kind of went from there. We talked about obviously the work you're doing in the in the gambling space and, and everything else that's going on with it at the moment. Um, and I said, well, why don't we do a roundtable? Why don't we just get the conversation out there and get people talking? And what was really interesting was I ran a poll a couple of weeks ago on how many housing providers are actually working in, you know, are doing something about gambling at the beginning, you know, with their services, how many talk about it, how many have got, um, there we go. how many have got, um, you know, any kind of preventative measures in place, and everyone said we don't have anything. I think that was really, really eye-opening to me, going, no one's doing anything about this. So uh, I'm going to pass over to yourself, um, but if anybody who is new to these roundtables, oh, my role is literally as a facilitator of the conversation, so Feel free to use the chat function at any time if you've got a question you just kind of want to immediately fire in. Um, if you want to use the reactions tool at any time as well, actually come in and have a conversation, that would be amazing. We want as many people kind of coming in on the conversation as possible. Just go reactions at the bottom and then uh, raise hand and it should come up like so. And then I'll monitor that and bring people in, um, leaving Halima to about the stuff that she really knows about and I'll do my bit. Um, and obviously, look, I know this is an hour and a half, so if anybody needs to go and grab a drink or use the bathroom or whatever it will be, feel free to just turn off your mic or camera or whatever it will be and come back and drop in and out as you need to. Um, but on that, Halima, I'll pass over to you to do your introductions and, and start the conversation today. Brilliant. Thanks so much, Matt. And yeah, I haven't done one of these before, but I've just been following all the sort of LinkedIn activity and comments and it sounds like it's really like a really engaging platform. So I'm looking forward to attending some others that... Um, perhaps I'm not leading on, but just some of the interesting issues that you, because that's really sort of, you know, topical subjects and issues you, you've got covered. So um, okay. really good to meet everyone. Uh, I have got a few slides that I'm going to share. Um, and Matt just so you just do this at the start, just to give you an overview of the project and the area I'm working in. Um, and then I'll just close that so that it's just more conducive to the kind of round table rather than uh, a presentation dominating your screen. Um, you should be able to see this now. I'm yeah, that's exactly right. And um, go into a slideshow without removing the gallery. Oh, brilliant. Okay. It's always disconcerting where everyone disappears and suddenly you're talking to yourself on a PowerPoint. Um, let's remove this. Hide meeting controls. Excellent. Um, yes, yeah, so, uh, Matt, thank you. Thanks for hosting this today. And it's just, it's a really great opportunity to find out from the sector a little more about this um, area of uh, gambling harm and its relation, relationship to housing or tenancy and security specifically. And, and that's the, the, uh, you know, the project that we're working on. It's Birmingham City Council. Um, and I work as a research fellow, actually, I work in a couple of different places. Now, Matt mentioned we, we, we met earlier um, this year at the Center for New Midlands, where I, I chair um, the Housing Communities Leadership Board. Uh, I also work as a research fellow at Aston University, where this project is based. And then I lead a small research group at the University of Birmingham, also on housing communities. So uh, a number of different hats, but the project that, that we're discussing today is based um, at Aston University. Uh, and I'll just, I've got my controls. Uh, so that's my, my email address, and I think Matt will do all the, all the kind of exchanging of information at the end, but I'm on LinkedIn as well, so if there's you know, anything that you feel like you want to sort of add or get in touch, touch with me as well, it would be great to hear from you um, after this discussion. There we go. So a quick overview of the project. Um, the the centre is the Personal Financial um, Wellbeing Centre at Aston University, which is working with the City Council, funded by the Gambling Commission, who are the regulators um, in the gambling industry. And we're trying to specifically understand the links between gambling harm and, and tenancy loss. 
Uh, and the idea is to develop uh, a kind of toolkit or some sort of intervention model for the council and, and ideally, hopefully, other social housing providers and other councils to, to be able to kind of identify, um, screen for, and help prevent tenancy loss due to harmful gambling. And there's different stages. So we're, we're just starting the second year of the project now. And what we've been engaged with for the last year is looking at some of the literature around this and some of the screening tools and uh, you know, some of the, the methodologies and, and things that are in place already. Um, very helpfully, uh, last year, the Public Health England produced um, a very extensive and rigorous gambling harm evidence review. Uh, so we've been able to look at that, that, that data as well. Um, and then uh, more recently, it's now the Office for Health Improvements and Disparities, Public Health England has branched off to two sort of sub offices now. Um, they've just produced a gambling related harm um, report for the Midlands. So that's also been interesting to kind of look at, look at as well. Doing some benchmarking, looking at what other councils have been doing. So Manchester, Leeds, Liverpool specifically, uh, with the caveat that the community programs or community harmful gambling community prevention programs uh, in some of those other councils and, and cities are, are more broad based. So they're looking at sort of more, more widely at harmful gambling and harmful gambling prevention, intervention, support. Um, whereas I think this project is quite unique in the sense that it's linking homelessness or housing loss or tenancy loss and the links between housing and, and harmful gambling. Uh, I see uh, sort of, uh, Harvey is on, on this call as well. So hopefully he'll contribute to the discussion as well. And Harvey um, Rayner is based at the Birmingham City City Council and he's the lead on the project there. And he's been working working um, on the kind of scoping baseline stuff over the last year. So trying to understand mapping that customer tenant journey, what are the different frontline contact points, you know, whether it's sort of from pre-lettings through to, um, you know, the temporary accommodation through to neighborhoods. That, no, so we'll talk about some of those just now. So in the sense of trying to understand before developing a model where those kind of sort of, you know, the journey points and contact points are. And the kind of next steps where we're at now is looking at setting up a couple of tenant focus groups um, in, a, a, in terms of co-designing some of the methodology moving ahead, uh, looking at some pilot interventions, uh, perhaps through um, adapting online housing forms that are already existing, and also uh, a new a survey that we're sort of, uh, designing as well. Um, I know a few of the comments, and sort of Matt posted this, a few people sort of mentioned in the LinkedIn chats as well about uh, what does gambling really mean? Is there a common understanding? And it's a very, it's a really good point because, uh, you know, our understanding of gambling and gambling has changed and evolved. And it's a very sort of broad, broad definition. So, gambling is betting, gaming, or participating in uh, in a kind of lottery where you kind of win a prize. So there's a there's a betting or a, a prize associated, and gambling includes actually a, a kind of wider range of activities than we sort of traditionally would consider gambling, where you to go to the bookies or horse racing or you know sports betting. So it's, um, you know, the lottery is casinos, bookmakers, online, um, there's bingo, but increasingly now it's sort of online gaming as well, um, uh, including in-game purchases. I mean, also eSports is a massive multi-billion dollar and pound industry as well. And the nature of gambling has shifted to online. And this is sort of predates the sort of COVID pandemic as well. These were the shifts anyway. Uh, moving towards uh, more sort of marketing and you know now it's this spooky thing where you say something and then half an hour half an hour later Facebook Instagram tells you you were looking for a you know a TV cabinet or something so it's that sort of specific uh, you know targeted marketing addictive products um, different kinds of sponsorship and then the, the shift to kind of online uh, which has obviously been exacerbated with the pandemic and, and the lockdowns as well. So moving from gambling to problem or harmful gambling, that's um, defined, again, there's different definitions and different conceptions around sort of harmful gambling, but it's, some, it's a gambling rated activity or harm that has an adverse impact on health, on well-being of, of an individual, of their family, and then broadening out to communities and society. Um, and from the, and the kind of often cited one is the American Psychological Association, who, who um, they are the body that developed the, di the DSM, the diagnostic, um, one of the di diagnostic screening tools, and they define it as a dis sort of disordered gambling. So here it's more of a clinical definition. So it's a behavioral addiction and it's classified as an impulse control disorder. I think interesting here, this is why you often see um, in the cases of harmful gambling, there's also you know, often as other associated um, disorders, or you might have substance, substance abuse or um, alcohol, 
Um, so they are often associated addictive behaviors that come along with harmful gambling as well. And the types of harms that are uh, identified in the literature range from kind of financial to relational to psychological, cultural. That's quite interesting when it comes to taboo or stigma, um, criminal, and then sort of health detriments as well. The financial I've highlighted because interestingly, um, as I say, we're looking at housing. It's quite a unique take in terms of looking at housing and harmful gambling, but in most of the literature, housing is sort of boxed in the financial harm side the column or the category. So really not being able to pay your rent or not being able to pay your mortgage or being in a, you know, having that level of debt that means you results in homelessness. It's, it's very much located in a kind of financial harm, but we could obviously argue here, if, you know, we're focusing on this project that there are wider harms and all of these aspects could really be relevant to um, a tenancy loss or losing your home. So I'll just pick some of these key figures. So um, like I mentioned, the Public Health England staff, um, Health Surveys England, We've got um, a kind of 0.5% of the population experiencing problem gambling across, across England. And then the prevalence for the East and West Midlands are 0.5 and 0.7% respectively. So, I mean, it sounds like quite small and when you look at the percentages, but when you then sort of look at the size of the population for the Midlands, you've got approximately six and a half million people gambling, then 440 to so nearly half a million who are harmful gamblers. And then even more worryingly is that it's not just a harmful gambler who will be affected, it's affected others too. So there's an estimation for every one person who's experiencing harmful gambling, between six and 10 people are directly affected. And that makes sense in a housing context as well, doesn't it? So if it's not, if you're evicted on your own, it's your whole household is evicted. So if there's someone who's experiencing harmful gambling, uh, there's a whole household um, effect. And of course, maybe then you have to go and stay with family or friends, there's an impact on them. So you can, you can see the sort of the ripples of, of effect. Also, um, in terms of uh, prevalence, problematic gambling or harmful gambling is more prevalent in areas of greater deprivation. And we know the Midlands has higher levels of deprivation compared to um, England averages. So some of the screening tools we've looked at, the most common ones are the DSM-4 and the PGSI. And the PGSI has a short form as well, which is just a couple of questions. The DSM-4 tends to be more clinical. The PGSI, which might be more appropriate for this project, um, is one that's sort of a not in, in a non-clinical context that sort of frontline service users can can um, adopt. And then what what this is, this is just very brief overviews. But in terms of support, uh, it's not the idea is not for the uh, you know frontline housing officers to then provide the support. It's a referral to specialist support. So Aquarius is the, the local charity that works with Gamp Care that provides support um, in Birmingham. They have a screening question that they use as kind of gatekeeper question. Has your gambling or the gambling of someone close to you had a negative impact on your life? And we're thinking about how we can incorporate this in perhaps some of the existing forms and applications um, where there are vulnerabilities or other vulnerabilities already included in some of those, um, in some of those forms or, or some of the um, uh, processes that the frontline officers use. Is there a way that this can be incorporated as an existing and robust tool? Um, I just have a question in the chat, Halima, which is, have you considered lie bet for screening? I'm not 100% sure what lie bet is, but I don't know if you've heard of it. It must be another tool. Yeah, if you, yeah, if you, no, I haven't. I'll have a look at that one. Thank you, Andy. Um, I've got the box closed, so yeah, thanks, Matt. If there's questions, okay. yeah, 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 yeah it's, well. it's not a lot of slides here, but at any point, please, thank you. That's really helpful, Andy. If at any point um, anyone wants to interject and, and ask a question or ask me to clarify, please do. Um, right, so referral that could be, you know, for addictive behaviors, so it could be cognitive behavior therapy, it could be counseling, and I mean, Aquarius, when we were discussing the types of uh, work that case work, the support workers do, it could be um, interventions like self-exclusion, helping, helping someone uh, put in the online tools to sort of block going onto those particular sites for online gambling, or physically going, attending at a bookmaker and saying this person no longer wants to be able to, to gamble. So there's different forms of interventions and the idea is not for the council to then uh, undertake these, but it's to refer on for this kind of specialist support. Um, and I think here, and, uh, you know, another tricky thing is that harmful gambling charities, so this is across England, suggests that um, most, it's mainly uh, gamblers or harmful gamblers coming in uh, who are self-referring or um, referred by affected others or coming through um, professionals like GPs. So here is another challenge in terms of this, you know, the idea of kind of trying to screen across, across councils for this being a potential issue. Uh, I'm not going to go into this in detail, but it's basically what, some, what, what in part, as part of our project team, um, we've taken the public health England data analysis and looked at the West Midlands versus, versus other regions 
Um, there's certain sort of higher risk groups and certain higher risk factors. So, um, you know, sort of males, but sort of more females more recently, sort of younger ethnic minority. Um, and this is just basically just showing the difference between uh, sort of trends across um, England and then trends specifically for, for the West Midlands. But there are this, this you know, there, there's kind of data that we can draw on and reflect in terms of understanding you know, sort of aggregate pictures, and we are now trying to sort of um, uncover that and sort of explore this bit further. Ultimately, it's a hidden problem. Uh, and as, as Matt and I have been discussing, the more you try to find out about it, the more you realize how hidden it is. Uh, and we know, you know, just going from that, those key figures I've shared, that there's just far more pre prevalent in terms of harmful gambling as an issue that is screened, that is reported, that is referred in Birmingham. And this is corroborate, corroborated by um, harmful gambling support charities. Um, and it reinforces this kind of rationale um, for, for the research as well. If there was not a need, we know, we know it's a, it's a, a really um, important issue. Um, trying to understand the links between gambling and housing. So that's quite complex. Um, and looking at the literature, there's been a few studies. Um, and what they indicate is that there's a two-way relationship. So it's not like a causality from one to another. So if you, if you, um, uh, already homeless, you might have a, a predisposition towards more harmful gambling, or harmful gambling can lead to tenancy loss or to losing your home or to losing a mortgage. So it's a two-way relationship between homelessness or tenancy loss and problem gambling. Gambling in the, ho in the homeless population is lower compared to the general population, but rates of problem gambling are higher among those who are homeless. And that ties into rates of problem gambling being higher among those who sort of poorer from more deprived backgrounds as well. Um, so those are some of those um, links we're trying to sort of look at. Um, the Public Health England Evidence Review, again, as I mentioned, it locates housing as a financial harm. And what they've tried to do here is estimate uh, the cost of financial harm based on statutory homelessness applications. Um, so here they've estimated it to be about 62.8 million. Um, but what they have done is that they've admitted there are some um, uh, difficulties with methodology and also this assumptions that are made with regard to, for example, families being in you know, the cost of temporary accommodation and typically temporary accommodation being four weeks. And we know that in reality, temporary accommodation can be a year, can be 18 months, even longer. Um, so, so there is an acknowledgement that the um, methodology um, is not that developed, but there is, there's, you know, there's a lack of evidence here. control, I've got my gallery bouncing around. Mm. Apologies. Not that involved. <laughs> um, I'm just, yeah, it's just, I've got the screen blocking the, see if I can move it. Um, the navigating bar, there we go. Sorry, it's just, a, yeah, not not that many. Sorry, I don't, I don't want to just to dominate the round table by me just talking at everyone. Really looking forward to hearing. Good, it's interesting. Thank you. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> hearing from everyone as well. Uh, so in terms of, you know, so Harvey will be best placed to sort of touch on any of these if anyone has questions regarding the kind of scoping work, but really it's identifying those different teams. So the lessings, neighborhoods, rents team, temporary accommodation, um, all the housing offices have had questionnaires they filled in and Harvey's been interviewing team managers and frontline officers. There's approximately 20 in each of those sort of service areas, There's some sort of 18, 16, some 24, 25. And no one um, in all this sort of year of scoping work has ever done a referral for gambling harm. So I think that's, that's the big takeaway. There's just not been any referrals done. There's some limited training, not recently, um, on uh, trying to screen for, identify, or looking for the signs of, of harmful gambling. There's little awareness of it. Um, and what, what now is quite interesting is that the city council have found some historic notes that have been on, sort of input on some of those management forms, um, tenant notes, et cetera. And they're trying to sort of go back and look at some of those cases to see if um, they can follow any of those. But again, it just reinforces how hidden this issue is. And if you think about that versus the numbers that we know is in terms of prevalence, you know, there's obviously something there. So why, why, why do we think that this is an issue? There's obviously barriers and challenges. There's stigma and taboo that's that's beyond you know city council and council tenants you know that's just um, just the issue of gambling as per se, um, and then specifically you know we've been discussing and this has come through from the housing offices as well is that you you know this makes sense there isn't really a vested interest to disclose a gambling problem because you you will think it might jeopardize your chance of securing a property or maintaining an, an, a tenancy. 
So, so there isn't that vestige. So whether it's from pre-letting stage, whether it's at rent area stage, there's, you know, there's, there's a conflict of interest there to say, look, this is a problem I have, or ask for help. And we know we've identified a key communication gap in that vulnerabilities don't lead to exclusion. Councils have a duty of care and support, and tenants will sort of need to understand um, as part of this that you know if they just ask for help or if they you know if disclose that they have a, a vulnerability on harmful gambling, it actually increases their priority for housing and support. So that's a kind of critical message to get across um, in this intervention model and support. So some early considerations. Uh, as, I, as I've described, the different customer uh, or tenant contact points to provide opportunities to match uh, against the scalar spectrum. So these screening tools I mentioned earlier talk about sort of low risk to medium risk to high risk, and we can match those across sort of contact points as well um, on the level of intervention that happens. There's, you know, it's, it's obvious that the um, screening training uh, or gambling awareness training more broadly is critical, essential for housing services seen and working with Aquarius to kind of develop um, maybe bespoke training for the different uh, service areas. Um, and the housing officers are really so, um, they have such high case loads and to, to get them to add this to already a really huge loads, it needs to kind of minim minimize the burden uh, for it to be adoptable and effective across the council. And you know, what, one challenge is the different IT and housing management systems. So there's different data systems used across the different uh, service areas. So this will be interesting you know, to get uh, maybe some social housing, housing association um, perspectives as well around that. So that needs to be taken into consideration around how, how this is kind of screened and uh, how this intervention might work. Okay, just a few more. So next steps, as I, as I mentioned, we're looking at focus groups now with different tenant, tenant groups to discuss the issue, to, to ask them about you know, the, the sort of prevalence context, but also um, the survey we look, we're sort of trying to draft at the moment, getting the input to. We're gonna pilot an inclusion of the screening question on, on maybe some of those uh, IT systems not across all the service areas. We'll start off with that. Um, and then, as I said, this uh, a short anonymized survey, but also allows you to then disclose your name at the end for support. Um, and again, to get over that barrier of, you know, harmful gambling, we don't call it a gambling survey, a financial challenges survey, but it does include aspects around general financial hardships, but also um, having that screening question in there and asking about gambling activity. Um, so what we'd really like to get out of today, so Matt and I have been discussing this as well, uh, there's just, a, you know, some of the things I've been thinking of across your organizations, have you ever come across cases of harmful gambling? If you have, where have they emerged? Has it been, for example, debt advice? Has it been at rent arrears? Um, is anyone aware of problem gambling being a specific issue linked to tenancy loss? Um, does your organization have existing referral pathways for support? And what's the level of training? So this already sort of Matt put, I think you put a LinkedIn poll on that and that came across universally as, as no, it's just not, it's not on the radar, is it? really so, not it's really really not and i think that's yeah. the I, I think that was the bit i found most surprising actually and again i think this comes a bit back to that yeah you know the part you made about the the vested interest andy do come in and just so you raise your hand there do jump on oh sorry were you not <laughs> no I'll, I'll use the reactions sorry uh, um, that's right no worries at all very interesting um, uh yeah. yeah i think i think that part but that vested interest is really yeah. really interesting is key mm. because at the moment, everyone else can kind of understand other areas that we're talking about that could be detrimental to housing, but yet are more comfortable talking about it because it's become acceptable to talk about either drink or drug issues or whatever that might be. But gambling is still very, exactly. very, very taboo. And I think there's still that element of it can affect everybody. You know, I've had friends who've definitely had gambling issues that they've had to sort through themselves, but it's almost like, oh, just sort it out. There, mm -hmm. there is that understanding, I think, around it. Yeah, I completely agree. And as you say, there are there are developed referral pathways for other other addictive um, issues or around substance misuse or alcohol. So why shouldn't there? Be, and it is that taboo, and it is also that confusion around you know what will this result in? Um, the last couple of questions yeah, I thought we could we you know we might might want to cover is uh, have you been aware of an increase in gambling activity and what types? For example, we know that kind of shift to online as well, um, and then also associated harms. So. When you sort of when there've been cases of alcohol or substance abuse or domestic violence, antisocial behaviour, has problem gambling ever come up? Because again, you know the research shows that these are, are kind of linked and associated. And then, of course, the kind of imminent, um, uh, you know, the, the urgency of the winter coming, the rising fuel costs, the cost of living crisis, 
And is there is there a sense that this might lead to more problem gambling and further risk of tenancy loss? So I'd just be really interested to hear um, you know, your thoughts on those. I'm gonna close this here, stop the screen share. Thank you very much. I think there's a lot of really, really interesting facts there. And again, this idea, you know, it isn't if one person is doing harmful gambling, that it isn't just affecting one person. It's, you know, I think you mentioned there's six to ten people is is absolutely key. And so hey, I was putting the chat there, we're generally not good at talking about money anyway. And I, I think you're, you're bang on with that. Do you, do you want me to turn this one off? There you are. Uh, so those are off there. So um, in terms of kind of that opening point then, you said, you know, do you feel there's an increase in 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 gambling do we uh, is anybody kind of noticed within their own housing associations or rps i know people from different areas an increase in in gambling being talked about or is it still very much just kind of swept under the carpet who'd like to kick us off harvey i've seen you've come off mute so i'm going to jump on you first yeah it's kind of swept under the carpet to be honest with you so i mean from my side of of the project um the front facing teams that we we've, we've targeted um a lot of the officers, um, they say that through their experience and that, they can pick up if someone's got a gambling, but because of the time scale and th their role, it's not something that's already it's, it's been stipulated in, in their job role. So if they do, if they say that what it is, is it's, it's what it's gambling is, um, they do like a income and expenditure um, applications and they do ask the questions. But um, obviously, if the um, customer isn't saying that I've got a gambling problem or anything like that, um, and they're requesting for help, they can't do anything. What's happened is, is that the four teams that I've um, that um, I interviewed um, and sent out questionnaires to, they've said that if 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 gambling has come up, come up, it's um, it's basically um, they've said that um, they've the, the tenants are vulnerable. So they've got other issues. So mental health could be alcohol, drug misuse, depression. Um, and that um, obviously as Birmingham City Council, we've got we've got a duty of care. So what, what it is, is that the officers obviously deal with the vulnerability side of things, um, deal with the, um, the, the the rent increase and everything. But when they request for for a referral to be completed, the, um, the engagement with the officer comes to an end. So that's where the officers are, 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 well, that's where it comes to a, a standstill. There's no further um, conversation with the tenant to complete a referral, get the help and support. And that's where um, we probably need a bespoke training for, for our officers rather than just training on gambling. It's regarding what their job is or their role and find significant training so that they can ask and find and locate where the gambling problem is and obviously provide the support. Do you think that's come from a, I agree with you, I definitely think there's a lack of training, but obviously people are finding out there's gambling issues. Do you, do you feel that there is in part, because there is such pressure, I guess, on housing officers and things at the moment to get involved, that, you know, to get someone signed up and to make sure their immediate needs are cared for, adding another thing to it is just like, oh, I can't take that on as well. Or do you feel it's just a lack of training really and not knowing what to do next? It's a bit of both, Matt. Um, it's um, obviously it's a time scale of the job. Um, um, obviously, there um, the teams have been reduced over the years, um, and and the officers ain't been replaced. Um, and it, I mean, gambling. It's 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 come about probably with the rent team more because um, of what's happening is is basically the support teams for like the lettings for the lettings team. The officers provide 12 weeks support if, you, if you're vulnerable. If the case gets enhanced because it gets triaged, um, for example, um, there's, it goes to the, uh, the, the visiting team, the, the support team, and they provide 12 weeks support. But what they're finding is, is that they're just resolving issues with, with the properties. So it could be the gas electric, it could be repairs. Um, so they don't get time to engage with, with, the, with the tenant and find out if they've got any other issues. and what they're saying, what, what all the teams are saying is basically, and this is what I found as well um, from the research, from scoping, um, scoping this report, um, this project, is that people are afraid to tell about, to, to raise issues about their vulnerabilities because they think 
it's going to go against them. Now, what what people don't understand is that once their housing application gets gets approved and they can bid, um, they get so many chances to bid on a, on a property each week. So they can bid on a property and they might be number two, but depending on their on their um, on someone else's vulnerabilities, they could go higher. So obviously, um, tenants um, come back and say, "Well, I was number two, now I'm number 20. and that's when we explain to them, saying that obviously there's people who are in more hardship than yourself, um, and and then and they were, but what it is that they're unaware that if you've got vulnerabilities, that the council have a duty of care that we will help and support you, um, because you are a priority. Um, so one of the other things is um, is advertising that, for example, gambling and other other vulnerabilities on our website um, and get people. And then it gets about how accessible that, that is as well, isn't it? Yes, yes. It's it's a it's a big thing. That, so when, for example, for the letting team, when they're doing a pre-let, so when they're contacting the officers, but sorry, contacting the tenants to find out, um, just, just to find out about um, their income, their benefits and everything else. There, there is vulnerability questions, but there's a, um, no one will admit to it because I think it's going to go against them. It's going to go against them securing a property. But also, them if if they if they if they do say I've got mental health or alcohol drug drug um, a problem, there's um, it's just a tick box. But there's no referral um, that can be made. Okay. So that's something yeah. that we're looking at. So there's a few changes on the systems because what we found is that there's three systems that the council use, which all teams use. All the teams use, um, and obviously, um, as Halima did say, that uh, Birmingham City Council, there's uh, gambling isn't being recorded anywhere. The only place that I found after speaking to data analysis uh, officers uh, within Birmingham City Council is on the, a system which the whole of housing um, officers can use and can have access to, uh, which is Northgate. Um, and what we found is that under a section called notes, gambling came up. And that's where Halima said that we found some cases um, and that's where gambling officers are put down gambling. And then we've, um, that's, that's where I'm, that's where, that's where we am at the moment with the project. It gets so, so lost in everything else, doesn't it? Yeah. I had, yeah, I had yeah. Sahail to bring in and then Andy, but Halima, did you just want to talk about what Harvey mentioned there or should I bring Sahail in? Yeah, I was going to say, I think Sahail and Andy both had um, questions as Brilliant. well. Sahail, mm. you come. Thank you, Harvey. No yeah. Some very interesting comments by Harvey and some of that I was going to mention, so I won't repeat it, but you mentioned in one of your questions about um, is it more talked about gambling uh, or is it still quite taboo? So I work in South Asian communities across the Northwest and what I've noticed is the conversation is still pretty much um, um, not there, so it's not openly talked about. However, when there's a space to do a presentation or a workshop or a training, then people are comfortable enough to actually talk about it after that. So it's about creating the spaces in order to have those conversations. So for example, many times I do a talk, then after the talk, somebody would come to me and say, well, I know such and such a person in the family who needs that kind of support. So I think it's about, uh, first, uh, providing a comfortable, safe space for individuals, uh, people to talk about it. So it's fairly still kind of taboo. And in terms of housing and um, homelessness and its relationship with gambling, I do meet a lot of clients um, from South Asian community who do experience issues with, um, this is for mortgage, you know, to find um, mortgage payments, rent payments, find it difficulty to kind of keep up with it. So there's a lot of um, secrecy um, in terms of uh, how gamblers uh, manage it. And also family members tend to then bail out and support that individual rather than seeking you know, mainstream kind of support initially. It's only when there's a crisis uh, that individual is at risk of eviction or repossession of the house that they would be referred into our service or something like that. That's, that's really interesting to hear. And also, I've, I've, I've noticed, I was, so, I was so pleased when I saw you register for today because I've been mean, following some of your, your the work you shared on LinkedIn that with Beacon and the, yeah. Sh the Sharon program that you've got. Yeah, yeah that's right. Just, yeah, it's really interesting. The thing you say about comfortable space is quite critical, but also 
about the fact that it, it hits sort of rock bottom because that's really sort of homelessness tendency loss is that sort of bottom point. So we're almost kind of looking at both aspects. So, you know, yeah. the council does pre-letting workshops and we think that might be an appropriate time to raise it in a more preventative way. But then yeah. equally, when you get to a stage where you're about to be evicted, you've got 500 to 1,000 pounds of debt accrued. Yeah. Um, yeah. This is, a, you know, it's really a critical juncture, but you, ideally you wouldn't want to get to that point. You want to sort of exactly. interview people and make, make that um, support clearly available. But it's interesting that you say about that sort of safe, comfortable space and also yeah. and also the parallels with rent and mortgage, because not, you know, this is, we're looking here specifically at council tenants and council yeah. tenants. But, but equally, um, you know, it's just the link with housing as well. So whether it's rent, whether it's your mortgage, and, you know, specifically, you know, with ethnic minority groups, there are particularly vulnerable group for harmful gambling. Yeah. Well, that's stigma to go. So yeah. all those insights are really welcome. Thank yeah. you. I mean, a recent case study that you might want to look at, which is quite interesting from a housing perspective, is um, there was a domestic, a domestic um, homicide review, um, homicide review of a case where in, from a minority community, the, um, a husband murdered his wife um, in Tower Hamlets in 2019. And they had a history of m not meeting um, rent payments. And um, the wife, the, so the wife of the gambler, would regularly have interventions with the housing association that was connected. And within that review itself, that homicide review, there is no point at which the housing uh, organizations made a referral into a specialist service like GAMCARE or whatever local provision that there is. So that was quite interesting to note. I can share the document if you wish later on. Thank you. That'd be really interesting. Thank you, Sahil. I think there's a, a big piece within that around that as well that gambling is seen as acceptable. It's yeah. still advertised on TV regularly. You know, yeah. with mental health and learning difficulties or alcoholism, it's all talked about quite openly around if yeah. you yeah. need help, it's there. Whereas gambling yeah. is still is yeah. advertised on every sports channel and every sports event going. Andy, I'm gonna bring you in. So hey, well, thank you so much for your comments. I really appreciate it. Do come back in. Thanks, Matt. So just I've I've not met anybody here. I, I got the invite forwarded by one of my colleague uh, business partners. Um, so I, I, I work for an organization called Anonymind, and we actually provide treatment for problem gamblers. Uh, we're a business, not a charity. We get funding from organizations or gambling operators themselves as part of research education support. Um, Halima, I'm very ha happy to share uh, our Q1 report. We treated over 278 uh, people uh, in, in that period. 43% uh, of them uh, had underlying comorbidities. And my, my point that I raised my hand on was uh, for, for Harvey is because it's a hidden addiction, a lot of individuals, their, 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 parent, uh, their, their spouses and family don't generally know. So if it was a joint application uh, mm. and a bank statement came yes. out, then that, that could be a bit of a, an interesting uh, conversation with the, with the wife at that point. Um, we set up the organization Anonymine to provide um, remote access. Uh, so to, to, a, to address the point of stigma, uh, I don't want to walk into the gambling clinic. I'm not going to the NHS gambling clinic. Um, I don't want to be uh, be seen to be, you know, having a problem. Uh, and we did that because the the the, um, the organisation Leon House, uh, who's like the parent uh, company of Anonymine, they they have a um, a residential facility in uh, in Manchester, and that was set up to support veterans who are transitioning out of military. And they were unable to get um, uh, mortgages and things like that due to the fact that they had gambling on their bank statements. So they were providing a, a level of, let's call it, sort of short-term shelter for, for these individuals. Um, so it, it is a it is a well-known issue that in a financial scenario, if if gambling is on, you know, it, you know, deposits are, are on your bank statements, that's pretty much a taboo. Um, but the other problem is uh, a lot of our, our worst um, higher risk problem gamblers that we've treated are, are high street retail. So the, the digital tools that are there around time limits and all those sort of things, they're yeah. only restricted by the fact that, you know, William Hill and Labbrook's only open at a certain time and they close at a certain time because yeah. they walk into the bookies and they're kind of, they're in the shadows. Uh, and a lot of those individuals um, are very high risk when you come in with a PGSI you're at 16, 17, 18. That's like top top of the scale. Mm -hmm. um, 
and and there's an underlying comorbidity, maybe a depression, maybe a veteran with PTSD. Um, so th there is there is a lot a lot to it. Um, and I, I mentioned the lie bet, Helena, because we we're looking at trying to implement that with like like GPs, just to ask that very simple question: Have you lied about uh, gambling? Have you bet more than you can afford to lose? And if the answer is yes to one of those, then they really need to be um, put into like the National Gambling Treatment Service or you know, ourselves, uh, we, we look to partner with groups of organisations. Uh, we're not part of the NGTS, we're to the side of it, but we, we share the same goal to reduce gambling harm. So um, it's, it's really a case of make, making sure that um, when you identify that there is a gambling problem, that that individual is, is referred into the right, right solution. Yeah, I was going to say, Andy, one of the things um, that the officers say is that but if you establish someone is suffering from gambling, it's the next step is requesting for help and support to complete a referral. Without their consent, you can't do anything. Anything that's that's you know what I mean. That's where um, Birmingham City Council, the officers, have found that when they take that next step, it, the engagement is just gone because obviously their issue is that, for example, they're in rent arrears. Once that gets resolved. They're happy. They think everything's back to normal because people don't see gambling as a problem. That's, yeah. that, that, that's the underlying issue is that it's not a, you know, it's not a vulnerability. I'm, I'm OK. I'm just having a bit of fun. Um, yeah. So th th that's where we get to. So if once gambling has been identified, it's getting the, the, the tenant, the customer to say, you know what, you, you need the help and support. Do you want us to complete a referral for you in your behalf? Yeah. And that's what that's where the communication ends from, it, it, from it is form. difficult you know there's, there's a lot of charities yeah. there doing great work around that uh the awareness piece unfortunately when we we see them it's because my wife's kicked me out and she's not going to let me see the kids unless i sort my uh, yeah. gambling out um or you know we, we've, we've treated um 43 43 individuals had suicidal ideation when they came to us so you know it, it, it's, it's an issue and and 44 actually on on registration we ask we ask a question the first question is are you at immediate harm uh for yourself or, or anyone else and if you say yes okay you know 999 samaritans we're, we're not a you know we're not a, a, an immediate service we can give an appointment within 60 minutes but we can't um you know we we, we don't we're not 999 yeah and therein lies in part of the issue itself in that you've got you know i, I worked in the bookies uh way before I did recruitment, probably about 12, 13 years ago, and it was the same faces coming in each day, no matter how, yes. and you could see days where things were really bad. Uh, Nadine, I'm going to bring you in, I'm going to jump back to Helena and Harvey. It's just a brief um, comment about the lie bet, and that I am actually somebody with lived experience of gambling addiction, and I work, I've worked in quite a few charities and organisations, and just that question of, have you lied to anybody about your gambling? A lot of people will just say no, because they're not considering that they're lying because they've not told anyone. Yeah. So I don't exactly. think it's an appropriate question some of the time, just to add that in. What would you feel was to Nadine? How would you, uh, feel free to not obviously overshare, but how is there a way that you would rephrase that? It's just that question, because I know on the PGSI, there's lots of questions that are asked. Mm. And somebody else brought that question up and went, you could ask that. And I went, in my case, that wouldn't apply to me because I hadn't told a soul about what I was doing. So it's just mm. considering that hidden thing. And what I say during training is you can ask the question. My recommendation would be to ask it on a regular basis, that it becomes a regular conversation and that there's this drip drip effect on all different levels of conversations with tenants of mm -hmm. newsletters of just making it normal because gambling is normal so therefore gambling addiction or treatment should be normal as well but no i haven't got a particular thing but during training what i always say to people is you can ask the question you know do you have gambling do you have problems with gambling mm -hmm. expect them most of the time to say no because they may mm -hmm. not do at that time but they may do six months later they may not think they don't connect that that is the problem mm. but they'll remember that you've said it yeah yeah you are somebody yeah, that said it so it's those kind of things to try and just being human really of this could be anybody but yeah said enough. Okay. Okay. thank you it's really, yeah that's really that's really helpful thanks Nadine. and I, I did think that as well Andy when I, I saw sort of lie bet 
I, I think you sort of see the name and you think sort of lie straight away. And I think automatically when you, when you ask somebody straight up, do, have you ever lied? That, that in itself might be a barrier. Although uh, also the, I also understand the sort of counter argument that you need these questions to be quite clear and specific and draw something specific out in terms of a gatekeeper question, or the screening question. Because um, we have, you know, we've been we've had this discussions about this as well in terms of what's the best way to broach that subject, and um, you know, and also you're you speaking know. to Yasmin. Oh. Is that Mr. Kamal? Oh, mute there. Sorry. <laughs> Sorry. <laughs> so I'm not sure where that came from. Um, yeah. So I, I I agree that it is a challenge, but that, that's I think that's a good point about the the sort of normalizing the communication because. Like you say, even in, in, in GP surgery, you wouldn't necessarily see anything for gambling addiction as you would for other, other issues. And it is that, you know, it's something that's just more recreational and, and the, the harmful aspects of it are that hidden or, you know, and, and, and then just it's just not out in the open where it becomes something because you, you know if you have a problem, some, another problem, there is a, you know, the, the, you, you sort of you know the back of your mind, these organizations I can contact, this is the help I can get. So I think that that communication message is really key and having that embedded at all different stages from a pre letting workshop through to different, you know, different stages in terms of... Um, uh, Plus, I think there's that element with, like, mental health or whatever, or depression or whatever, but because so many people have become more aware of their own journeys and stuff over the last, I don't know, especially the last two, three years, I think, with, with everything with lockdowns. Definitely. Whereas if you've got friends who are... I don't know, who do gamble a lot or whatever, you'd be like, oh, that's just them. They just gamble a bit. They just... Enjoy and it's quite difficult to both like going, look, if you actually got a problem, whereas if someone's like a bit depressed, you go, look, man, I know someone who's been through it. Why don't you talk to them? There's someone often that can be more relatable. Andy, I saw you come off mute, and then I'm going to bring in David. So, Andy. Sorry, no, I was just I was just going to agree with Nadine. Look, it's, <coughs> I, I, it was just bringing awareness to one of the other um, questionnaires that we've uh, considered. We don't use it ourselves. It's just something that we were looking at uh, with a particular veterans cohort, to be honest. And I guess, you know, veterans are completely well maybe some of the uh, some of the people with housing support are veterans but i guess a veteran maybe it's a bit of a blunt question i completely agree with you um and you wouldn't necessarily ask it in, in that way i just wanted to bring up uh, an awareness that there are shorter versions of pgsi because even in the industry people think pgsi is a little bit long-winded uh too too many questions so yeah, yeah. Well, the academics as well that sometimes that you need to be blunt like sometimes you need yeah. to be blunt sometimes it's trying to just go have you ever lied about it mm. yeah. that's yeah. that's the thing exactly because you want to you want to get to the to the issue and and the, the pgsi does have a short form as well Andy. there's like that's the one we're considering also incorporating but the the, the point you made also andy about um the the remote access as well i think that's really crucial because this is what we were thinking it's so we were having this discussions and debate around you know having a rapport, having an existing relationship with the housing officer, being able to have the screening questionnaire, but maybe follow on a survey is something easy. Mm -hmm. The work we've done before with kind of around well-being and asking how happy are you in your life? How anxious are you? How satisfied do you feel? Do you feel your life is worthwhile? Those questions are actually easier to answer on an anonymized survey than it is for someone to physically ask you, how do you feel yeah. about your life? How do you feel like you're doing in your life? Whereas, you know, if you're sort of going through something uh, you you might feel more comfortable if it's anonymized, if it's something that's that's remote. Yeah, there are different uh, you know um, advantages and disadvantages with the different sort of um, modes and, and methods. But, but but equally, there are you know one of the things that we noticed that within the treatment availability, you know, mm -hmm. uh, forty percent of our our sessions are run uh, before nine o'clock and after four o'clock, uh, including weekends. So you know we we run seven to seven seven days a week. Uh, and a lot because we're trying to work around, you know, shift workers and kids in schools, and we're just trying to give that extra flexibility of anywhere, anytime. These things really, really matter, and flexibility is going to be key. David, thank you for being patient. Do come in. Oh, hi, everybody. It's been a really interesting conversation. Um, it's opened my eyes to a lot of things I'm really not very shadowly aware of, despite having been involved in researching housing, social housing for 30 years. Um, my, my puzzle, I suppose, about the conversation, the use of the word intervention, and I'm thinking, well, what kinds of interventions are we talking about? 
and generally the interventions that have been touched on seem to be to do with individual behaviour, treatment, support, those kind of things. And then maybe from the housing uh, department's perspective, looking at the interaction between gambling debt and um, security and sort of uh, ability to avoid eviction and that kind of stuff. Those would be interventions. I quite clearly understand that. But in terms of the idea of gambling as a social harm, I wonder about interventions whether to do with the structure and the, the approach taken by the gambling industry. And I know that the gambling industry is paying for some of these individual sort of interventions, but what about gambling itself? I mean, is there, is there something that can come out of a project like this which would um, uh, change the sort of incentive structure for, you know, I've, I'm, I'm a really interested in Premier League football and I'm delighted this year, but there are fewer clubs that have got gambling on the front of football shirts. Those kind of things I think are really important in terms of structural, um, changing the structure of incentives for people to be involved, uh, get involved in harmful behaviour. Well, I might be barking up the wrong tree because we're clearly talking about real difficulties that individuals are experiencing and those need to be addressed through interventions. But I also would like to see something that's happening cause the, the social harm that is caused by the gambling industry. Those are all really good points, David. Um, and good to see you as well. Thank you for joining today. Um, I think it's I think the point about the, the kind of structural stuff and, and the and the tension between the gambling industry kind of funding some of this work and some of this intervention work, that is something that's becoming sort of more and more articulated. I think some of the reports I read recently, like there's a new clinic that's opened up in Stoke there's another, another scheme in Dudley and, yeah. there's a, and, they, and they've, they've, I think some of them are after like saying some of the, the health boards are saying we don't actually want any of the gambling industry's funding because you're creating the problem and then throwing some money at us to sort of then try and foster, foster the effects. So, so there is there's definitely a tension around that. And also, um, it's interesting you pick up intervention because I saw on them, on, again, on the LinkedIn comments when Matt posted about this roundtable today, somebody talked about sort of, in, you know, what's, what is the point of an intervention? How do you intervene on, on this kind of scale? And I think, you know, and then coming back to what is it, you know, what is it intervening for? I mean, the original aims with the council and with the Gambling Commission were around something similar to what was coming out of the public health England stuff, which is the financial harm. So it's preventing the cost to councils, like the, you know, the burden of, home, you know, the homelessness costs. It's the cost to the NHS for supporting individuals. So, you know, that's one aspect. Um, and I think sometimes maybe toolkit or model might, might be better. And it's almost like, um, the, you know, it's not, and the difficult thing as well is that it's not a kind of clinical intervention per se, because that's really the one-to-one -one between a support worker and somebody who is experiencing harmful gambling. So it's almost like the model or the framework to support, to get to, to, get to that point where the intervention can happen to ultimately um, reduce the, you know, the, the, this, this link between tenancy loss. Or, well, essentially that's what we thought we were be reducing it, but <laughs> the fact is it's so hidden and so, taboo and so stigmatized, it's, this project has been more about uncovering than, re than reducing that kind of link. So really we, th we thought we're coming in to say, okay, like how, how do we know, what are the existing reports, you know, support referral pathways? How do we reduce this link? How do we break that link? What, what can be put into place, whether it's from debt management, whether it's neighborhood support. Um, but essentially what we've found now, it's more of an unpacking and an uncovering and, and um, bringing the stuff to the fore before then even moving on to the next step. So. We, those are all kind of questions we're grappling with, David, but ultimately it'd be good to have those kind of structural outputs, with individual, you know, actually positive impact on individual lives, and also for the council in terms of the sort of cost of homelessness um, and for public health England. So I think we just try to think of it in kind of on different levels, if you like. Um, I don't know if that's really helpful. It's sort of giving you the same question back, but we are considering grappling with some of those, those as well. And I think you just look at the look at the LinkedIn poll itself and say nobody. Yeah out of the 70 odd people that voted, no one's doing anything. I think, and that's the thing that like no one, so bringing this to the fore and getting the conversation started is, yeah. is the moment, the big key part. Alison, I'm gonna bring you in. Thank you for being patient. You're on mute. <laughs> there we are, first one today. So I haven't got my glasses on, so I can't <laughs> see the button. Um, yeah, I was surprised when, um, I'm well, not really surprised when everywhere said that they weren't doing anything because I, I grew up around gambling. My dad ran a betting shop and I thought, and I've worked in housing. I thought I've never actually thought about the two things together apart from the odd debt case that I've been involved in. So it's quite interesting. But a, a few things occurred to me. One is that there's the impact on health, mainly mental health and the cost of living and family. But 
gambling doesn't impact on the wider community in the way that say drugs and alcohol do so i think that's perhaps another reason why it's been a little bit below the radar in terms of priorities um, there's also, I think, a shift in gender balance. Certainly when I was younger, it was very unusual to see a woman in my dad's betting shop, whereas the rise of online gambling um, means that it's more gendered. And I think, I suppose there's something, I think we've touched on this about making sure people are trained to look out for it because they wouldn't necessarily spot it. But the, the flip side of that, I think, something something makes me slightly nervous around this about stigma. I have the same thing when it comes to alcohol. You middle class people can neck loads of wine without anyone ever suggesting they need to go into some kind of rehab. And I just think we, we need to be careful that this is around the fact that the gambling is impacting on somebody's family or their ability to house their tenancy, not merely because they're social housing tenants and we're in paternalism mode. Mm. Um, so they're, they're just my my thoughts on it really and involving the gambling industry but maybe not I don't know who people deal with at the top level but I'm guessing your top bods at William Hill won't have that much of a clue the people all know what's really going on are the shop managers on the street who who see the same people day in day out they're covering for people people's you know husbands wives come into the shop looking for I mean it's a bit different now everything's on the internet but there's some you know people the lengths people go to and visit in different shops and you know, it's quite a covert thing and, and difficult to win. Um, I used to work in Kendall, we had down. triangles. So I was in Betfred, across the road was Labrooks, and three doors down was William Hill. And people just used to go around. And if there was someone mm. they wanted to avoid, they'd look in the window, check no one was there, and that's the one they were going to. And it was exactly that. And I really liked your point as well. Um, both points, really, particularly on paternalism, I think that's absolutely key. It's next week's roundtable on Tuesday with Mercy, who's actually in the room with us today, is on stigma and, and, and on you know things like this and if we're suddenly going oh yeah well we're going to fix we're going to fix gambling by focusing on social housing i agree with you it's the wrong way to go but also this this idea about the group thing and and the wider impact i think financially obviously it can have a wider impact if suddenly you get into such debt that you can you know spend all the family etc but gambling you can definitely do alone and it's almost I guess still culturally acceptable to sit in a room and gamble by yourself and go online and do whatever else and no one really questions it Whereas doing that with alcohol or drugs, you know, if someone came in and there was empty bottles everywhere or drugs, people will go, right, you need intervention, we're stepping in and helping. You don't know about that with gambling in the same way. So it's much far more difficult, I guess, to, to try and manage and support there. And I guess, Halima, this was part of the, the challenge we're facing is that if you're not willing to talk about it yourself, mm. it's quite difficult to get to even know who to support or who needs support. Absolutely. And, and Alison, all really, really valid points as well um, on the sort of paternalism and, and stigma. It definitely started off as a, a council tenant project. So, you know, this is a hidden issue. Um, and linking, you know, looking at the link between tenancy loss and, and gambling harm specifically. Um, but yeah, it, it, that is really important. And I think what's come up in our discussions as well with the council is you know, how do you just isolate one issue as well? Because if, if you have on form, you know, is there, you can't just say, do you have a, a you know, a, an issue with gambling where you put a screening question in the survey or other officers ask, especially if we talk about sort of comorbidities or if you talk about associated other harmful behaviors, because often it's not just, okay, it's either the, the, you know, the bottles or the, you know, the online gaming. It's often a case of both. So there'll be or, or like mental health we discussed, you know, there could be sort of mental health issues and gambling or alcohol and gambling or domestic violence that's coming up. And also in terms of the wider um, community or societal impacts, I mean, there's also a link with antisocial behavior and um, harmful gambling and alcohol. So that's that came, that's come up in a few of the studies we've seen. But you're right, it's not it's not the same sort of physical impact, I, I suppose, because it's, it's, it's almost like a, like, you say, man, it's like, a, like a loan. You can kind of quietly and lonely get sort of alone, get on, get on with it. Um, uh, but yeah, those, those are all really important. But I think, I think the, the fact that it's not, I think just, just being very aware that it's not something on its own. Um, maybe Andy has something to say about this in terms of other issues, but often it's, it's a conflation of a number of issues. Uh, and also the causality is really difficult as well. There could be something that, you know, you could get into debt because of the gambling, you drink more, or you already have depression and then, or this leads to depression. And it's, that's, that's, that's why I think there's a lot of complexity in there. And we're not clinicians. So, we're, you know, we're not sort of clinical psychiatrists. So it's understanding that these are disordered behaviors as well, tied into, you know, this, where it's located, you know, where the project originates, which is around this kind of financial harm of 
you know, not being able to pay your rent. And then well, what I liked about your project in the first place was the fact mm -hmm. you were going, you're very much speaking to those kind of frontline officers. And it's something that Yasmin's mentioned in the in the chat there actually that it is vital this doesn't fall off the radar of our frontline teams. We yeah. must keep the conversations going with our teams, forums and networks because you know, as much as Alison said there about the shopkeepers and the betting companies knowing what's going on and, and they're the people on the ground. It's the same with housing officers. They're, they're the people who are out actually speaking to people and probably noticing changes in behaviour and patterns in behaviour. But I think as Harvey mentioned earlier, and I imagine it's coming on now, like that's that's a training piece that really needs support. Sorry, Andy, can I just ask Matt something quickly about the point he made? Um, you know, about the, you said sort of the triangle of three book bookies and then looking in a window and seeing someone to avoid. Who would that be to avoid? Is that just, is that, is that someone? It could be people who know them if they're trying to be more anonymous. It could be partners who are looking for them. It okay. could be, the problem is, is you have the three and then actually next door to Labrooks was the weather speed. So people come in, start, and you, I mean, we talked about alcohol and mental health and everything else, but come in, bets would go on at nine o'clock, then they'd be in Weatherspoons and they go across the next races and they might go across to a different one or, and and you just, and people, I know they might fall out in the pub or whatever it would be. So then they'll go, right, well, I'm not going there today. I'll go there. But because yeah, no, people was, know was, each other as well. It was yeah. really, it was. It that's was, the way people socialise. That, that's, that's someone who's, whatever vulnerabilities, issues they've got, that's them waking up and saying, getting out of the house. And that's how they socialise. That's how they can make friends. That's where their friends are. It, so, I mean, it was, but it was also, you could see at times, behaviours massively change. And yes. suddenly people were panicking and worrying. And, and you'd notice it with the length of the bets going up. Like sometimes they'd come in, there'd be a couple of pounds here, a couple of pounds there, whatever it would be. And it was a social element, Harvey, I completely agree. But then suddenly they'd put five, 10, 20 pounds down on bets that traditionally, and that's where we'd have to have conversations, go, that's everything okay. But if they say no, you haven't got a lot of power to really stop things. Andy, I can see you come off chat. Please do come on off mute. Oh, so, yeah, it was just a, a point that Lima made. There's, you know, there's different kinds of problem gambler. The problem gambler who's come from a learnt behaviour, they went to the pub at 16 with the old man and he nips out at half time, puts a bet on. Um, so so they've sort of grown up with, with gambling and I guess almost by osmosis. And then you've got problem gamblers who are there because... Uh, you know, they go to the casino uh, after work uh, because they've got a, a, an all right this job. Um, and then you've got the, the, the ones with comorbidity, you know, parent died, friend died, something like that. And it's their way of coping. Um, so there's, there are different reasons why people gamble. And, and some of them might be uh, more, more important for this topic, because if, if they're depressed and gambling, then, you know, they, they might lose their job because of the depression, but the gambling, which makes it worse, it exasperates the problem. Um, so I just wanted to make, make that point that it's not just, um, you know, just a problem gambler addict, addicted to gambling. There are the comorbidity reasons for, for gambling as well, which need to be accounted for, uh, which actually could cause some of your tenants uh, further harm. Yeah. You know, another thing as well, Andy, you know, someone who's, um, who's on benefits, it's unlikely they can walk into a bank and say, I need a loan. So what they do is that if they're gambling, right, they'll go to a loan shock and then things get worse and worse and then the debts increase. They've got no one to turn to. Um, yeah. And then that leads to other stuff like drinking, alcohol, drug misuse. So that person does not know where to go for help and support. So this is the bit that's um, that that we're finding as well that long we shots. Yeah, there's there's there's, a, there's, a, there's another cliff as well right now, Harvey, which is obviously the unregulated black market yes. gambling. Um, so whilst the operators, and I'm not pro or against any, you know, I don't have a view on it either way. I just want to help people. Um, the uh, the the operators can do their best to put in limits to say you know no more than ten pound a day no more than an hour a day no more than two days whatever those um, player player protection tools are but if they lose them to a black market that's completely unregulated and I, I had a a, a, a client uh, in the past couple of months and she was getting hounded emails phone calls text yeah. messages to try and get them <laughs> back on, um, uh, to to gambling. Not not from a you know a mainstream Willie Mills and those, but from a black yes. market, and and that's yeah. another one to, to to really worry about. 
Yeah, with with our tenants, what we found from the offices, from all from all the teams that I've um, interviewed in that, is that someone will say, I've got a gambling problem when they hit rock bottom. They go right at the bottom and then they'll say, listen, I've got, got nowhere to, got no one to talk to, got nowhere to go. You know what I mean? Hands up, I've got a gambling problem. That's that's the only that's the only way that someone will actually say that they've got a gambling problem is when they hit rock bottom. We did have a comment in the in the chat there from Yasmin, uh, who says she's personally known financial abuse being linked to gambling too. Even more reason to keep the issue on our radars. And you're right, it is. It's 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 never just kind of I guess gambling just on its own. It's everything that it brings in. Um, I'm aware there were a couple of other kind of points we wanted to bring in today, Halim. I know we mentioned ASB and types of, but. I don't see whether or not, I don't know whether Claire will come in if I pick on her now, because uh, uh, I imagine, because you've been very, very quiet. Now, for those who don't know Claire, she ran a roundtable with me a few weeks ago on data and whether or not housing associations hold too much data on their tenants. And I imagine, I'm amazed she didn't get up and have a scream when someone mentioned earlier that actually in the back end of, of uh, Northgate, people have got detail on on gambling, but done absolutely nothing with it. And I know this one of the frustrations you and I have shared is whether we hold too much. What are your thoughts just based on what we've talked about today on, on data and how, how a housing provider or a, or a regulator, whoever it might be, if they're going to hold this data, how it needs to be used? Because by some of it, actually, as Salim has mentioned, there's, there's some of the data is there. It just takes quite a lot of finding to even get to it. Mm. Thank you. Thanks, Matt. Yeah, I've been scribbling lots and lots of notes and um, trying not to scream and trying to think of a way that I can say this more um, productively and, and in a supportive way because I am absolutely on board with trying to help people with problem gambling. Um, I'm working with a charity at the moment um, <clears throat> who, who work in that area <clears throat> and I've seen the harm that it causes as well in, in my own family and I absolutely loved, I've written down um, what Alison said about we have to be really really careful that we're not assuming that if you're a social housing tenant who gambles you have a problem because there is this thing that middle class people like Alison said you can drink bottles of wine and that's absolutely fine but if you're not middle class if you're perhaps a social housing tenant and you drink then that's seen as a problem more easily you're more easily stigmatized so are we saying how do we recognize gambling or how do we recognize and support problem gambling and there's a big difference between the two mm. definitely all the things that everyone's talking about the hidden addiction the stigma the um the individual interventions all yet yeah, make absolute sense but i would I would warn not running into anything, not jumping into anything that involves collecting data or storing it, like you said, at the, on the back end of Northgate, hidden away in the notes where you can't get to it anyway easily. And stopping and thinking, what's your purpose and how are we going to do this lawfully? Um, a lot of people think of data protection as being just that security thing, you know, if we, as long as the data is secure, then we can do what we want with it. But it, it starts from why we're collecting it in the first place. So I would um, happily talk to anybody who's thinking about this. You know, <clears throat> no charge, just want to, to be able to help here. Um, but to think about that first and do connect with me on LinkedIn. And I, I post about this sort of thing all the time. <laughs> because how would you, you know, from your perspective, then how, how do you We've already said that obviously some of the issues there around around problem and harmful gambling is almost a self-reflection and a self-awareness that there is an issue. But if I guess you're seeing things start to turn or you're seeing change of behaviours or change in rent being paid or whatever it be, and you're aware someone has a history with gambling, is that not, and I'm asking this hypothetically and obviously a bit of a, you know, a, a, a challenge back question there of, you know, is this not something that, housing providers need to know but Ooh. I know equally on the flip side of it well we don't need to know everything because actually if someone is enjoys gambling but it's never a problem then you don't need to mm. know that. and absolutely we need to know about problem gambling anything that's affecting um people's ability to pay their rent or their home life to the extent um I think so Hale was talking about earlier the you know the um tragic murder anything like that we we do as housing providers want to know about that and need to know about that but it's having that thought process and documenting that thought process before we start doing anything 
So working out really clearly what is our purpose and what do we need to be able to do that purpose, you know, to fulfill that purpose. Um, and how are we going to go about doing it, you know, with full transparency and making sure the data is accurate and is available, you know, it's not in a back end um, or hidden away. And all those sorts of things before we start collecting any data. That's so your thoughts on that, Helena? That might, yeah, as soon as I told Claire in, I was like, I want to bring her in on this because again, it's just another <laughs> thing to think about, about, isn't it? Absolutely, that's a those are all really good points. Um, and this is something we're grappling with in terms of you know where and how to include that screening questionnaire because you know just, just sort of anecdotally, so Harvey's been speaking to you know this, this one of the IT data people at the council, and he said, look, it's quite easy to just pop the pre-screening question in there, and we've had to sort of this, well, we have to sort of take a step back, think about this. Where is it going? How is it going? What, what, is, what are we going to try and achieve by it? You know, are we at the stage where the frontline officers already have the training so that if you put a screening question in there from now, because it's easy to do compared to normally there's like a, you know, a lead in time of six months to change systems. So if there's something that's quite quick to do, because it's quick to do, it doesn't mean we have to do it. Um, we need to think about having the, the training in place, having, a, you know, being able to um, then say that leads onto something else, leads onto a referral, having the you know the support, the the processes in place before before that's done. So we are we are sort of grappling with that. But would would you, what just what were your thoughts? I don't think you have this just from the presentation you've heard today. That kind of general Aquarius question that we mentioned, including that um, oh, I can actually use the words again, something like has your gambling or the gambling of someone close to you had a negative impact on your life? So we're thinking about including that in, for example, some of the kind of pre-letting paperwork where other vulnerabilities are asked about, you know, so it's part of a bundle uh, where we're just trying to identify if there are any specific issues. Um, or, you know, this is what we're sort of, you know, discussing now across the different services. So something like that, do, do, would you think that would be sort of appropriate? Um, it or, will depend on mm. everything that you've just said about what you're going to do with that information, mm. that what I call the so what test. You know, if mm. somebody says yes, so what? What are you going to do next? If they say no, what will you do next? Will you ask them again or will you leave it then for forever or will you ask them every so often? If they say yes, will you talk about referral or, you know, what, what comes next? And working out what is the lawful basis for you to ask that mm -hmm. because you're, actually, you're, you're potentially talking about mental health data being collected there you know whatever that impact is it might be about mental health or, or even physical health so that's got a higher standard that you need to meet to make that legal mm -hmm. to do mm -hmm. that um, and that being transparent it's making sure that people know you're going to ask this and why you're asking it and if it's optional or not you know all those different mm -hmm. but so what is the most important mm -hmm. thing I, I talk yeah. about yeah purpose what what you're going to do next yeah that's exactly what we're kind of working through now so it's good that's it's good to em emphasize the importance of that thank you i'll be happy to speak to you afterwards as well thanks Claire. that's great i'll connect and we'll connect on linkedin as well brilliant yeah we're yeah. good to keep in touch over the course of the project i love linkedin it's so useful it's um, really <laughs> handy yes we can um, read more and more so it's <laughs> yeah yeah well this is this is exactly it and it, yeah. it you know it helps to bring in bring in you know forms like this together certainly um so on that kind of cost of living thing, and we've only got like kind of 10, 15 minutes left, and evidently we're only a couple of weeks away from, I think a lot of people suddenly really starting to panic. And, and yeah, let, let's be honest about it, October could be bad, and we're going to have, a, I think for a lot of people, a very, very long winter. Have you, or has anybody, I guess, within the room noticed at times of austerity, and Andy, this might be one for you or Harvey, um, you know, gambling increasing during times of, of the most austerity and i guess kalima comes back to that question we we're asking before that aquarius question i think could be useful in this in this arena because if people have got uh relationships with those who gambled or who have had problem gambling in the past at times of most desperation people do turn to gambling i've, I've seen it plenty of times through my own life you know friends, family, and, and obviously people I, I, I worked with. So with the way that things are going at the moment, for, particularly with the research, I guess, what is the, what is the solution? Or what do, we, what do we need to be looking at now to make sure we're 
preparing for what's going to be a very long winter because I'm just not sure what the answer is. Um, oh, Harvey, you've come off. Please, please come in if you've got thoughts on what to share. I mean, obviously, from our research, we found that during the pandemic, gambling was on the increase. Um, but one thing that we've also highlighted is that, you know what, it's not a case of just going into a shop now that you can bet, you can bet online. So, I mean, a lot, but when someone um, secures a property with Birmingham City Council, obviously you have to provide certain paperwork and that. So like, as before, you could pick up when someone's betting from their bank statements and that, but now the organisations call themselves different names. So it's not, it's not so easy to pick up. Um, but from our research, our neighbourhood offices, we used to have four neighbourhood offices before Birmingham City Council. We've only got the two. So what we found is that, um, that our neighbourhood offices, 75% of their job is to do with local welfare provision, prepayment cards, right? So we used to offer, this was before the pandemic, you were only entitled to about, I think, two or three, I think over a six month period. Um, but now they're issuing it every day. They go, the queue outside the neighborhood office is for people coming to pick up a local welfare, local welfare provision prepayment card because they haven't got enough money. They have food vouchers every 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 week. They, they're coming for that. Um, and one thing that we found is that there's a lot of vulnerable people who can't come to these offices because there's only two offices now. And what we're, we're suggesting is that there's surgeries. So maybe at obviously Birmingham, Birmingham we've got about 40 uh, local community libraries as well. So maybe have surgeries open opening at, at these um, uh, libraries where the vulnerable people will be able to attend. And if there are any issues and concerns, we can raise them there. So that's that's something that we're looking at. Um, they have our neighbourhood offices have trialled it out, and it's been very benef beneficial. And even the local MPs have got involved as well, and they're trying to um, promote it more um, and, and and get so more of these services. People open. can't spend that money on on gambling; they have to spend it on certain. It's areas. basically it's, it's what what we find is that obviously because people are gambling, you can gamble. From your home from your property you, you don't need to go anywhere no one needs to know anything a lot of people don't know it's people hide it and then if they've got any issues and concerns they don't know where to go but a lot of people don't get into certain offices and that find it difficult as well because of their health and that so with the offices closing and that we're saying that if the surgeries can can open at other um, places where vulnerable people can get to and get the support that they need mainly about that communication piece isn't it again that awareness that yeah. this is an issue and we need to we need yeah. to talk about it and i think probably there needs yeah. to be a a program and, and probably by rps now saying look you know even if it is just an awareness piece mm. you know and i mean i guess it's that question you that you know on that regardless of, of thoughts on that kind of live bet thing it's just getting people thinking about actually are they are they gambling more come on andy in you come yeah, in, interestingly, in, in so when an individual presents with gambling harm to um, to the NGTS, the National Gambling Treatment Centre, there, there is a, a, an assessment that takes place, and it's based on the data reporting framework, which was designed by GambleAware. There's three, there's four questions. I just double checked. So one is, does the individual have a, an acute housing problem? Is their housing unsuitable? Is there a risk of eviction? Are they in paid work? So there's there's a couple of I've never run a report on these uh, these uh, items. So of, of the data pool I've got, I, I don't know. I'm going to have a look, Halima, and I'll, I'll let mm -hmm. you know the answer. Um, but there are there are some um, some clues, I guess. I would have thought that yes or no. Uh, and, and one of the things that we do, which is different, is an extra question. Who would you recognise as the cause of your harm? Um, so, you know, I bet with William Hill, I bet with Ladbrokes, um, all of them. That's that's quite a, a common answer. Um, that as, as as Matt said, that you know they go around the triangle. Um, but in, in a in a pilot, you could actually, if you had a focused study, you might be able to identify particular shops on certain high streets, and then maybe that's where a campaign around awareness of these kind of topics could be done. So just just sort of throwing some ideas out of based based on what I've heard, um, because there there are there are ways of almost identifying areas of harm within regions it's completely possible yeah i think a specific 
targeted local campaigns is a good idea. Um, especially we're dealing with one, although we're saying one council is the largest council, isn't it, in, in Europe? Um, but I think the other issue as well um, with regard to the cost of living and um, the sort of fuel and the winter coming, the other thing Aquarius mentioned, and you're not sure whether this has come up in terms of like, you know, specifically on sports events, whether you had a, like a, a, a bigger intake of referrals, but they did mention like the World Cup coming up as well. Um, and they, they're expecting that to then also um, add to the you know, conflation of issues. Um, around financial difficulties, plus you've got those kind of they, they have risk factors, really. So you, know, you think about it, isn't it? Like, oh, yay, World Cup. Yeah. And mm -hmm. it's actually, a, so, it exacerbates the harm. Yeah, in, in January, we had a, a huge influx in, in females uh, registering, um, sort of late, late January, um, maybe as part of, uh, you know, bills are coming in and, and, and mm. stop. Maybe that's the reason. Uh, we, we were averaging around four uh, registrations a, a day. Uh, during Cheltenham week, uh, we were up to twelve, so that's definitely um, in 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 peaks there. Yeah, and yes, there is there is concern that during the World Cup, at certain points, that will happen again. I think when it comes to something like football or it comes to sport, people feel they have a better chance of winning because they know more. And I think it, you know there, there's that element of going, oh well, you know, I don't know about horses, I don't know about this. Oh, but I know about football. I have more. Of a, that's a guarantee. And then evidently it's it's not the same way. Nadine, please do come in. This is just an added part of things that are going on at the moment. So yesterday I was at an appointment with somebody who spent their heating allowance that's been sent through from the government on gambling. So now he has no money for that. He's had to get support with his debts. He's being warned that there'll be no more support for him if he continues to gamble. I'm not convinced he, won't, he will stop, but it's just things like that, that that next payment is due quite soon. And just being, it'd be interesting to see who's actually, you know, utilised that in the right way. It is scary the way that's been just delivered to people yeah. who are most at need for, for any number of reasons. Um, and this isn't just social health and this is in, in the wide community. And suddenly money's arrived and I don't know what people, yeah, you know, it, it, it was that mindset of going, well, of course people will spend it. Like that's where it will go, it'll go immediately on spending. I know it was the issue we had with the universal credit when it credit. first came through with this yeah. idea of, well, the tenants will get the money, but well, we need to get direct debit set up now because else we're never seeing it. And it's, it's that kind of issue still is still is ongoing. Um, and I'm just, yeah, I really hope that person, whoever they are, can get the support they need. But as you say, then we're looking at, looking at a, mass, a massive increase, I guess, in homelessness over the winter. Mm -hmm. because but there's also impacts on the housing associations that if your rent doesn't get paid and you have to evict it. somebody there's an impact on there so yeah uh, absolutely so yeah, yeah i think um yeah i was going to say um a lot of the cases that officers came across is that obviously the rent um people are on universal credit um obviously a lot of them have been in temporary accommodation so you can be in temporary accommodation for a few weeks or you could be there for two and a half years three years and obviously in temporary accommodation, housing benefit pay for your pay your rent. So when you go to someone who's in temporary accommodation, do you know how much your rent is? A lot of them don't even know. Um, and then when we try to say, listen, we need you to secure a property because it's costing the council a lot of money, um, keeping you in temporary accommodation. So when they're going to temporary accommodation, they're on universal credit and you explain everything. Um, you sign them up, you get them on, a, you create a journal for them. And then... This is this obviously like with winter coming and that I can see it increasing as well. A lot of the officers found that, you know, when they're seeing the rent side coming to themselves, even though officers will, if, if someone can't manage their money, we'll get a direct payment um, made to the landlord, so it's Birmingham City Council. Obviously, once they work out how what to do, they'll if they if they have a difficult month, like the difficult months that are coming ahead, they'll get that rent paid into their account. And then they'll start spending that money on whatever. So it could be gambling and everything. And then obviously what happens is, is that, that the rent arrears increase. They think that they've got, that, that, that they will be able to resolve the issue next month when they get, I don't know, help and support from friends and family, but then it just increases. And that's what's, that's, that's probably what, you know what I mean? That's a lot of the officers are worried about is that the next couple of months with everything happening, people are going to dip their hands, especially if you're in universal credit, and get the rent and use it on gas and electric and that, as well as gambling. So yeah, it's going to be difficult times. It certainly is, Lima. 
Yeah, I was just, it was, I was just noticed we, we were just for a few minutes left. I was just wondering from, was, you know, we haven't heard from everyone, I uh, appreciate some, some people are listening in, but I was just wondering if there are, um, you know, if there is anyone here who's from a, from a so, you know, social funding provider, from a housing association, whether you have, you know, existing referral pathways in place. And, and likewise, if you're working for a charity or, or working for a, an organization that helps, with harmful gambling, whether whether you're aware of specific referrals coming from housing offices, so just just from your kind of sector or industry experience, from work, if if this has ever sort of come up on either side, from from the housing organisation side, or if you're on the receiving end as a charity, because this is what we're finding really difficult to, to sort of track or or find examples of or, or what 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 practices are in place already. Um, so if there's anyone sort of on either side of the of that sort of spectrum who who could um share just their experience that would be really useful yes nadine so ju the appointment yesterday was with a housing association a very small one in the greater manchester area okay. um that i've also run training when I, I used to work at gamcare and i used to run training on women and gambling um okay. and work with quite a lot of housing associations across greater manchester and there and the conversations we had about asking that question a lot earlier than at the point of eviction because you know I think it's really important for for gamblers to face consequences you know because we had a discussion about whether you know at that point of eviction whether they got six months grace to sort themselves out and and I'm kind of of the thinking of as soon as you get that breathing space you just fill it with gambling mm -hmm. whereas sometimes you need to face the consequences of your behavior and be homeless. I know that sounds a bit heartless coming from somebody who's had gambling addiction, but it's it's having those things in place that you ask earlier and, and just have those conversations where it's normalized. And those and that conversations are coming from different directions all of the time. How do you find working with housing providers, Nadine, in terms of Doris Nadine or Nadine, apologies. Um Nadine. uh, uh I, you know, how 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 receptive are housing providers and support providers and working with organizations such as yours because certainly when i was like i said when i did my my poll online it was an overwhelming we're not doing anything on this mm -hmm. and 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 i think that's probably hilly why i think there's a lot of people today who the amount of apologies last minute apologies they got today was actually really really large and i think it's because a lot of people were a little bit worried about being called out and going we're not doing anything i think there's certainly an element of that and others have obviously come along today which is brilliant from we want to learn we want to know what's out there but uh Nadine from your side how receptive are our RPs and working with you um I think it was a couple of housing associations out of quite a lot of associations that were approached and they were really receptive and what you've also got to remember is this isn't just about the people that we serve that's how I describe clients and service users it's also about the staff you know the staff are not immune to gambling addiction or being harmed by it and I also just done an off shoot did quite a large piece of work with DWP and during that time of getting ready to work with clients members of staff were coming forward saying actually this impacts me so there's always that kind of thing if we treat this in a professional manner but we also have families and communities that we live in where people are impacted by that so I had a really good interaction with people and that they took it on board whether that increased referrals or not, I couldn't say because I left the, the charity after that. But it's, it, I think it's certainly worth doing because they're up front, front line facing. They are looking at statements. I know there's a million different ways of having mm -hmm. money to gamble nowadays. But you do create those relationships with people and you can have those conversations. I guess this comes back to Alison's earlier point of going, this isn't just a social housing thing. It's you know it, it's, it's, it's who it's affected. it doesn't discriminate that's what we say not at all and and we need to make sure we don't do the same mm. uh halima thank you so much for bringing this to the stage today i think it's I, I do think we need to keep running these i think this is just the first stage there's clearly a lot that we need to to get involved in there's a point there from ali murty um when you talk about early intervention this is fundamental to the homeless reduction act 14 in 2017 you have the prevention duty. I don't know if there's scope to harmonise that with the white paper. Uh, a, a really, really interesting point to end on there. Uh, are there any final points from yourself, Helena, that you'd like to make? I just, yeah, I mean, I just meant to, again to um, echo your thanks to yourself, Matt, for um, just hosting this today. And thank you for 
it just it's, it's great to have a different audience and also people people sort of working across the spectrum people with lived experience thank you david for coming as well um and, and for your inputs um i pop my email addresses um in the chat as well so a few of you mentioned about sharing documents maybe sharing data or catching up it you know at this stage the, the more experts the more expertise we have on board uh the better so you know we, we are it would be nice to be able to sort of touch base again with certain individuals and um get your input perhaps i'll make sure that gets shared around and uh obviously the recording will go live yeah. there's a lot yeah. of people wanting to watch the recording back so exactly. i'll make sure that goes on there as well yeah, and any colleagues or associates, etc., who you can uh, let know about the project, and also any, you know, any any of those kind of questions we discussed, if you think they might have something to kind of contribute as well, that'd be brilliant. But yeah, just thank you to everyone for your participation and um, the discussion. Couldn't, couldn't agree more. As always, these are funded by my recruitment business. Uh, I, I mentioned at the beginning that's what I've been doing for ten and a half years and set up on my own last year. So I keep these free, but they're funded by anyone who needs recruitment help. So if you need support, please reach out. But apart from that. The next round table is on Tuesday. Uh, like I said, that is going to be with Mercy and, and it's focused around stigma and their really, really recent, interesting piece of work. So hope you can join us there. The link is now live on LinkedIn. But for now, thank you, Halima. Thank you, everybody, for coming today. And we'll Thanks speak to you soon. Cheers. Thanks, everyone. Thank you. Bye. Bye, everyone.